A couple announcements before we start our service this morning. Uh, we are in the midst of a diaper challenge for Homefront. Our goal is to collect 100 packages of diapers or wipes by May 22nd. You can leave them in the back of the worship space. You can leave them in the scout hut. Um, last year, we really beat the challenge with far more than 100, so let's try to do that again this year. We are also coming up on Mother's Day, and every Mother's Day for us is Blanket Sunday. There is a sample of a heavy blanket back there. Blankets are used not just to keep people warm, but they can be used as tents. They can be used as rain shelters. They're comforting. A donation can be made in memory or honor of a loved one. There's a basket back there to put money in, and there is a sheet which you can sign. You can also drop off your donation with your uh, desired memory or honor of to the church office uh, by next Sunday, by May 8th, because that is Mother's Day. This is our first Sunday that we are going masks optional. Do what you feel comfortable with. If somebody next to you is masked, you might want to ask, do you want me to mask also, just so that they have a comfort level too. Are there any other announcements before we yeah, start? Yeah, sure. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to add to that mask uh, advice. I'm, <clears throat> the, mat, the choir is going to continue to wear our masks when we sing. I'm still not convinced that singing loudly in a choral setting is completely safe. I know the choir is back a little bit and um, we're spread out. I'm not too concerned about it. But, um, but singing is an activity that you may, it, I, for one, am going to put my mask on when I'm singing. If you tend to sing loudly, which I hope you do, and with all of your heart, and you're spitting all over the place, you might. <laughs> <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> if you're at home, go ahead and sing out. <laughs> and if you're one of those people who buries your head in the hymn book, and only the hymn book is going to get the, <laughs> then you might feel safe too. <laughs> Are there any other announcements besides Carol's? And just, this is more on the personal level, but for all the people who are members of Ewing Church for a long, long time, I bring you greetings from Nancy Prince, who I unexpectedly spent over an hour with last night. And she is great, and she says hi to everybody. Let us worship God. We light this candle to remind us of Christ's presence with us in the midst of this pandemic, connecting us all to our separate places, strengthening all those serving in the front lines of this pandemic, and encouraging all who have been made known. Fear can overtake us. Uncertainty can overwhelm us. You know, the paths that lead us away, moving farther and farther from the center of chaos, you find us. Come alongside us, O oh God. May we be inspired and turn around to heed your call once again. Let us together sing, sing hymn 242.
none of us come here this morning claiming perfection. We all do things we wish we had not done. We all sometimes don't do things we wish we had done. Let us bow our heads as I read the prayer of confession. O oh Christ, sometimes we are so busy talking with each other that we fail to find you beside us. We carry on so focused on our questions that we do not create the silent spaces which would allow you to speak with us and enlighten our journey. Let us take a moment of silence to speak to God and ask those questions. Stay with us, reach out toward us and invite us to pause and meet you. As we look at our lives and that of the world around us, we are sometimes too anxious to share our real questions, our doubts, our fears, and our hopes. We keep them within us in troubled silence. Again, let us be silent for a moment to think and divulge our doubts and fears to God. We call out to you in hope and trust we will discover you in our community of faith. Whether we believe it or not, Jesus Christ never leaves us and never forsakes us. Let us open our hearts to receive the grace which Christ brings to use in its faithfulness. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us join together in the congregational response. Christ is risen. Verse 2 of hymn number 248. peace and love with each other by a sign, a heart, a peace sign, a wave, a smile. And in some cases, <laughs> a hug. Let us join together in prayer. O oh Lord our God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Draw us in to pay careful attention to your word. Give us all the grace to receive your truth in faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The first scripture this morning comes from the Old Testament. It comes from the book of Psalms. It's a psalm that is a song for the dedication of the temple. It's a song of David. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths, depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you as faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. 
To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will you, the dust praise you? Will it proclaim, proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever.
I always think it's such a gift um, when people share their gifts. And I am always especially moved um, when music becomes the proclamation of the word. So thank you both so much for that gift this morning. So our second scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going to go fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So Jesus said, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After Jesus said this to him, follow me. May these words, too, be blessed to our understanding this morning. Now, many scholars agree that chapter 21 is an addition to the Gospel of John, serving as a kind of epilogue to the narrative. It's after the disciples have closed themselves off in a room, mutually afraid of what might be next, when Jesus comes among them and offers them peace. He has his own Pentecost moment with them by breathing the Holy Spirit upon them right then and there. As I preached last week, the breath of God didn't send the disciples on an immediate path of service. They were again in the room a week later when Thomas had his own encounter with Jesus. And again, days later, they return to what is familiar. Unsure of what to do next, Simon Peter decides to fish and invite others to join him. 
with six disciples taking him up on the offer. Peter and the sons of Zebedee were fishermen before Jesus called them from their boats. So this was something familiar to hold on to, to return to. It must have provided a sense of comfort. Or at the very least, all seven men would appreciate a distraction. And they cast their nets all night and caught nothing. For men who had spent their years laboring, this must have been just one more thing on the heap of things that were embarrassing and frustrating. They had no idea what to do after Jesus blessed them with the Holy Spirit, and now find that they can't even bring in a catch of fish either. Neither here nor there, what are the disciples left to do? They're in their weariness after hours of struggle, and I'm not just talking about fishing here. They don't recognize Jesus initially as he stands on the shore calling out to them. And it's only when they cast their nets on the right side of the boat and find it full of fish that they realize it's Jesus. Once again, Christ overcomes what we as humans consider the limitations of death. It's not just in his life and ministry that Jesus can create miracles and show signs of his kingship, but also in resurrection. Even now, Christ can touch creation, and it's in this moment, in this way, where the earthly and heavenly elements touch once again, that the disciples recognize him. So exuberant and full of joy, they bring their boat to the shore and find themselves welcome to a charcoal fire already stocked with fish and bread. And this is another element of this epilogue that I love. Jesus invites the disciples to add their catch to the mix for breakfast. Because that haul of fish in their net, the one that's so full that it looks as though it should burst, it isn't just a sign that Christ is among them. It's also a sign of what they bring to the table. And those gifts won't be wasted. Jesus invites them to add what they have so that they can become active participants in the meal, which he will soon bless and share. Now, don't move too quickly beyond this part of the story, because how often do we look at what we have to offer and think that it's nothing compared to what God offers us? How often do we discount what we make from the blessings of creation, the day-to-day -day labors that we complete each week, and say that they don't really matter? Don't we sometimes see our work as the complete opposite of what we deem as ministry, without allowing ourselves to believe that ministry can happen outside of these walls in a conversation over coffee with a friend, or in the administrative tasks and piles of paperwork that sometimes take hours to wade through? How often do we think God surely couldn't have called us, couldn't have called me, that there isn't anything substantive that we could provide, whether in what we make or even just in who we are? Don't we let ourselves get wrapped up in everything right in front of our eyes without remembering that if God made us, and God wants us to take part in who we are, too. And then there's Simon Peter, always exuberant, excited, act before he thinks disciple. I have no idea why he was naked in the boat. Did you all hear that in the passage? <laughs> no idea why he was naked in the boat while they were fishing all night, which now, as I think about it, seems kind of cold. And even if all of them might have been naked, but the teener, teenager that still lives inside my car can't help but chuckle when I read that he put his clothes back on and then jumped into the water to greet Jesus. I guess he was trying to maintain a little bit of modesty in the face of his Messiah. But imagine what that must have been like. Each stroke bringing him nearer and closer to Jesus, the Messiah whom he had denied three times. I can just picture him paddling quickly at first, but his arms slowing down as he realizes that each stroke also means that he's much closer to having to provide an explanation about his denial. 
three denials after his own denial in the upper room that anyone among them would say that they didn't know Jesus. The charcoal fire on the shore, its burning embers and warmth must have brought Peter right back to the gate with the guards who were warming themselves in a familiar way. The crackling sounds in the background so recently in his past as three times he was asked, aren't you one of the man's disciples? Aren't you one of them? Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Only this time, Peter is asked by the man himself, Peter, do you love me? I've always read this story as Jesus's reversal of Peter's denial only days earlier. Three times he asks and three times Peter answers that he does indeed love Jesus. But what if the question also reflects something deep in Jesus's heart as well? How often have we asked of those around us, do you love me? The actions of a day or week or month make us wonder if the person or people we surround ourselves with are signs that they have affection or not for us. Couldn't it be possible then that the resurrected Jesus wondered the same thing about his own disciples? It's as if he says, do you love me? I mean, do you really love me? Because I have planned and put a lot of stock in you. I've trusted you to carry on this ministry and it is not going to be easy. You're gonna fall, you're gonna fail, but you'll be called again and again to pick yourself up, dust yourself off and try again. So do you love me enough to be able to do that over and over and over again? Was Jesus compelled to ask him this simple question three times to be reassured of the love of the disciple before him? <clears throat> Friends, here's the thing. Even if Jesus and Peter brought all that they had felt from the days that had unfolded after his death and resurrection, the question, do you love me, is all about relationship. As Caroline Lewis, professor at Luther Seminary, has said about this passage, she says, forgiveness is perhaps not the issue at all. We all like to fall back on it, frequently assuming it's that which is what's needed to fix a relationship, especially to mend this specific relationship. But in this case, a little more digging and some careful study reveal that what Peter needs is to accept who Jesus needs him to be. Jesus does not blame or shame Peter. Jesus does not ask for Peter's repentance. Jesus doesn't ask three times, Peter, do you love me? To remind Peter of his threefold denial, to test him or to trap him. Jesus simply reaffirms who Peter needs to be, the disciple Jesus needs him to be. And the disciple Jesus needs Peter to be is the shepherd now. No wonder Peter responded with, I am not. Denying our identity is an all too often reality. We deny who we are because we worry that we won't meet expectations. We deny who we are because we're afraid to disappoint. We deny who we are because we could be judged, even rejected for the truth. We deny who we are because we do not believe that we will be liked for who we truly are, or that we will be loved for who we truly are. We play it safe around a lot of people in our lives, pretending, and honestly, rightly so. Not everyone deserves our truth. Not everyone can be trusted with our truth. And if this is the way we feel with people in our lives, even those closest to us, the same would be true of our relationship with Jesus. And yet these resurrection appearance stories serve as a reminder that each one of us is called, claimed as children of God, we are to be active participants in the deepest yearnings of the world around us, not because we can do it perfectly or that we have it all together, no, instead, we're to do it because we're in relationship with a God who will not let us go. A God who desires to be in relationship with us. The divine one who is keenly focused on how our love is lived out loud in the world around us. 
God who calls us just as he did with Peter to nourish the world and those around us in the same caring way a shepherd, our shepherd, has fed and cared for his flock. And simultaneously, we acknowledge that when we fail, when we fall, we find a place where our shortcomings don't stop us in our tracks. That our doubts that anything good can come out of our lives don't keep us from God's continual action to find us and reach out to us in relationship again and again. It's in this way that we'll see that the risks are worth taking, that returning to what is familiar as the fishermen did that night, it's comfortable. But we aren't always supposed to be comfortable. And in those moments when we've gone back to what's easy, God finds us, calls us back, and asks us to add to what has already been provided. May it be so. We'll continue in worship this morning with hymn number 724, verses 1 and 4. Confession of 1967. So let us join in one voice and proclaim what we believe. God's redeeming work in Jesus Christ embraces the whole of a person's life, social and cultural, economic and political, scientific and technological, individual and corporate. It includes the natural environment as exploited and despoiled by sin. It is the will of God that the purpose for human life shall be fulfilled under the rule of Christ and all evil vanish from creation. With an urgency born of this hope, the church applies itself to present tasks and strives for a better world. It does not identify limited progress with the kingdom of God on earth, nor does it despair in the face of disappointment and defeat. In steadfast hope, the church looks beyond all partial achievement to the final triumph. We invite you now to contemplate one way you share your gifts with the church. 
whether that is through a financial contribution or through a contribution of time or both. As you listen to the offertory music, there are offering plates on the front communion table, over in the back over there, and in the back over there. Also, if you neglected to pick up your communion elements when you came into church, the box of them is over on the hymn rack. Let us listen together to the offertory music. together the prayer of dedication. O oh God, today we offer what we have. We invite you to be with us as we share our love, our devotion, and these gifts. May our eyes be opened to your holy presence among us, now and always. Amen. As we prepare to gather at the Lord's table, let us join together in singing hymn number 506, verses 1 two and four. Look who gathers at Christ's table. <laughs>
prepare to join together at this table for communion. If you are joining us in Zoom and have not uh, grabbed your communion elements, now would be the time, even if it's a cup of coffee and a donut. Um, and if you do that, we will all be jealous that that is what you're using um, for communion. But um, before we gather, as we're, as we prepare to gather at this table, um, if you are joining us on Zoom, please feel free to place in the chat. But those who are gathered here, if there are any joys or concerns that you would like to share with this worshiping community, please do so now. Are there any prayer requests this morning? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm asking prayers for Betty Ransom, who is at Greenwood House, having uh, thank you. Betty, thank you. She's having physical therapy, and if anyone is, would like to do send Betty a card, I know she would appreciate it. Um, yesterday, uh, Betty Schubert and I visited with her, and I think it did her a lot of good. And, and it would help anyone. Thank you. Prayers for Betty. Feel free to reach out. Any others this morning? My friends, my siblings in Christ, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. And they will come from north and south and east and west to come and sit at this table in the kingdom of God. According to the Gospel of Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples over yet another meal, he took the bread. He blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to them, and it was in that moment that their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. And our Savior invites everyone who trusts in him to share in the feast that has been prepared. So let us pray. Friends, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our right to give our thanks and praise. Praise to you, O God, for all your works. You created the world and called it good. And you made us in your image to live together in love. You made a covenant with us. And even when we turned from you, you remained ever faithful. So with creation, we sing your praise saying, holy, 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 Lord God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Thank you, O God, for sending us your son. He lived among us and told your story. He healed the sick and welcomed sinners. He shared our pain and died our death, then rose to a new life that we might live and all creation be restored. So remembering your boundless love revealed to us in Jesus Christ, we break bread and share the cup, giving ourselves to you to live for him in joy and praise. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and that we may be his body for the world. By your spirit, unite us with Christ and with one another until we feast with him and with all your saints in your eternal realm of justice and peace. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior taught us, we are bold to pray together in one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, 
Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and poured it out, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this too in my remembrance. For every time we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we are proclaiming the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God. For each one of us gathered here in this place, the people of God. The bread of life. The cup of salvation. Friends, let us pray. God of abundance with this bread of life and the cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people across time and space. <laughs> so now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our final hymn is number 720, Jesus Calls Us.
I'm so glad they moved the piano so we could see who was playing it. Yes. <laughs> that was Marianne. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> it was Peter last week. We couldn't even see who it was. So. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Get on. Should I should I mute myself so you guys can talk amongst yourselves? I I think we'll start making this uh this time pretty short, and I'm gonna end the webinars pretty quickly. For one thing, I can't I I can't start uploading the service until I end the webinar. And that takes about 15 or 20 minutes. So. Hey, George. How you doing, George? Mm -hmm. You're fine. Thank you for asking, Mel. Good. All is well. Glad to hear that. Good morning, everyone. Everyone be well. I'll see you next week. Hey, good morning, good. Sam. Good morning, Sam. Look forward to it. Hello this season. I will. Thank you. Thank you. And Sam. Hi, Carol. Well, hey. I'm going to go ahead and say what it means. Okay. No. Hi, guys. Hi, Betty. Alex is doing a great job preparing the tech. And she played blue music. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. You know, there was a moment where I was like, I can't get it. Okay, 